All right, as you know, as you should know, I'm keeping an eye on those that are falsely teaching this idea that Jesus Christ reigns a thousand years. It's not found in the Bible anywhere. It's not found in Revelation 20. It's like a completely different religion, not unlike the religion that teaches Jesus and Satan are brothers. All right, so I found this video right here. 22 hours ago, it's Cat Kerr and Good, hey. and Steve Schultz of Elijah Clips. Okay, so let's listen to what they have to say. You know, you, now you, I, this is a day I'm just going on the rabbit trail. You, you introduce something else and say, okay, let's talk about that now. Okay, I've never uh, asked you anything about the millennial reign of Christ. Um, maybe the millennials today will are all going to be there. <laughs> but but let's say the millennial reign of Christ, uh, hundreds of years from now, whenever that is. It's happening right now, not 100 years from now. It's happening right now. And the point that I want to make clear is how can you rightly say that you are saved if you are not reigning with Christ right now? You see, it doesn't make any sense. If you are born of God, you are reigning with Christ right now. Right now, we that are saved are a holy nation. We are a royal priesthood. And we reign with Christ right now. And um, the reason this is a unique time period is because we are born of God. And just as Jesus said the kingdom of God shall be taken from you, talking about the kingdom of Judah, taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof, and that is those of us which are born of God, those of us that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ who has come in the flesh. God manifested in the flesh. All right, and so blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. This Resurrection is the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we that are born of God are partakers of that resurrection. We are born of God and the second death has no power over us. We are saved, secure, sanctified, sealed forever. And we can be confident that he which has begun a good work in us will perform it until the day of redemption, until the day of Jesus Christ. So let's continue. Um, you said it just said it's in this Jerusalem, the Jerusalem that we were going to be there in April and May. You know, that Jerusalem, he's going to rule from there. Is a temple going to be there when he's there or no temple? I'm quite sure there will be some kind of a temple there. Uh, because he will be sitting on a throne in the temple. Okay. Okay. On that temple mount, right, theoretically. I would say, if it's Jerusalem, he yeah. will be in, ruling from a throne. It would have to be in that place. It would have to, it would have to actually be that place. Actually, a lot of the Bible is written about that area. Uh, yeah. We were over here in the United States and other places. We weren't even around when all that was even discussed or talked about of course god knew that we would be here he knew that we all right so you know she they're trying to say without being specific they're trying to say where is jesus ruling from during this thousand years and obviously right now we are in the thousand years and jesus reigns over us and he reigns over the house of Jacob and of his kingdom there is no end so this idea that Jesus reigns for a thousand years uh, it gets talked about a lot but it's not true at all and what's interesting to me is that these people never tell you or talk about what happens when Jesus is done reigning, when he stops reigning. Uh, because if they did, I think they would realize how ignorant their view is. 
until we would be friends with Jerusalem. He knew all that would happen. Yeah. But mainly, these things happening, even the battles taking place, aren't going to be here. The, the battle, you know, during the Paris times when yeah. the devil tries to take over in his great big battle move and he loses again. That's going to happen over there. That one doesn't mean it won't affect people living here. Yeah. On this side. All right, so I'm not sure what. Yeah, I, the, she's not being very specific, but my guess is oh, I'll have to do this because I'm not real sure. Uh, to me, it, it sounds like she's implying um, the battle, the great battle, which is Judgment Day, the Day of the Lord. Okay, and. And there it is, Second Peter 3. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. The, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. So... When Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, we are lifted up, we that are saved are lifted up, and the unsaved are gathered at our feet, and, and fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them all. Just like what we read in Revelation 20. This is not a one-time standalone deal. This is all throughout the Bible, consistent everywhere. And you're not going to find anywhere in the Bible, not even in Revelation 20, about this idea of Jesus Christ reigning a thousand years. But here, in verses 8 and 9, we see that the, our, the unsaved is gathered at our feet, and they are destroyed forever. This is consistent with the rest of Revelation when it talks about the vials and the wrath of God being poured out upon the whole earth. And then this is prophecy fulfilled that goes all the way back to Genesis 3. I hope you understand I'm treating you as though you've not seen any of my videos where I talk about this, but you have to bring it up every single time just so people might understand that um, we know the story. I hope you know the story of, of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and Eve was told not to eat of the tree, and she ate, and so did Adam, and because this has been done, God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. That's a symbol of uh, Jesus stomping his heel upon the head of the serpent and crushing it forever, which will occur on the day of the Lord when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven and our enemy is gathered at our feet and fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them all. It's all the same thing. It's not separate events. It's a one-time deal. And it comes at the end of the world, which is prophesied all throughout the Bible. Very simple. The whole thing's connected. And uh, it all you need is faith if you have faith um, your eyes will be open and you'll start to see these things side of the world but most of those places in the old testament they were that's where they happened they happened in the area in the new testament that's where they happened in the area and even in the future when they talked about local revelations those were in things that happened in that area okay so think about this so when jesus comes in the clouds of heaven and he gathers together his elect. Let me ask you, do you believe that that is going to happen only in that area? Right? I mean, think about it. And the angels shall gather together the elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So it's not only in that area. So also, when the unsaved is destroyed, it's not only in that area. It's everybody in the entire world is going to be faced with this, the Judgment Day, the Day of the Lord. That is the very area where Christ will rule as King.
king of this world, and there'll be natural people in the world that don't want him to. Okay, so, oh, buddy. Oh, oh, I was going to say that, uh, <laughs> well, all right, that really burns me right there. That burns my butt. But let's go real quickly. Let's go after Jesus returns. Okay, there's a new heaven and a new earth and a new city, a holy city, New Jerusalem, which comes down from God out of heaven. All right. The, the Jerusalem that's over there now, that's going to be burned up. All right, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, and there's going to be no more sea. And um, so, okay, let me backtrack here. Things that happen in that area, that is the very area where Christ will rule as king of this world, and there will be natural people in the world that don't want him there but they can. all right so I, i'm a little bit confused she's so she's talking about jesus being on earth and ruling during the thousand years and this thousand years comes after he returns in the clouds of heaven okay so this is all kinds of crazy all right, because when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, it is the end of the world. All right, and Daniel talks about it. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, they all talk about the end of the world. And that happens when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. We read this in Revelation as well. Behold, he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him even them which pierced him and all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him even so amen this is the end of the world all right and go back to genesis 3 this is when jesus comes and he crushes the head of the serpent and all the unsaved are destroyed forever all right so there are no more unsaved people now if you're not saved you're gonna like hearing this idea that hey people that are not saved are going to get a second chance all right and let me see if I can find something here because I mean there's Bible verses to support everything and through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not and their damnation slumbereth not all right so um, let me, the very first verse is very interesting here in 2 Peter 2. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. All right, so what she's saying is that you don't have to believe in Jesus Christ right now. You can wait. Just wait until he comes in the clouds of heaven and wait till after the judgment of God and you can believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's no other way she can squirrel around this because she is claiming the thousand years happens after Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven after he has gathered together the elect and what this nutbag is saying excuse me she is saying that there are going to be saved people living with unsaved people which isn't that interesting because 
that's happening right now is it not but no that's not what she's teaching she's teaching that the they're we're going to be uh, changed in the twinkling of an eye so just in case you're not paying attention here so in matthew 13 it talks about the wheat and the tares and how they are growing together until the harvest comes and the harvest comes the wheat are lifted up to meet the lord in the air and the tares which is the false wheat is gathered and burned okay now and so that's happening right now but so when jesus comes in the clouds of heaven we are changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed now you notice that here it said the last trump and here in Matthew 24 verse 31 and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet this is the same moment in time this is the same sound of the trumpet at the last trump for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible so make no mistake about it she's saying that we're going to be changed into our incorruptible bodies and we're going to be living with unsaved people who are still in this corruptible body that we're all in right now and that's bat poop crazy that's bat poop insanity it really is but let's listen they can't stop him from being yeah that's uh, so okay so a little bit more about then the millennial reign he's on a throne it's in a, a temple or a temple like structure all weapons will be destroyed okay all weapons destroyed no nuclear war no wars nope. He's ruling with a rod of iron, which is, I've never, that's during the uh, millennial reign, with, with a rod that's of iron. Over, okay, all right, so let's talk about that. The, the ruling with a rod of iron. We see this uh, a few times in Revelation, oh, and, and in uh, Psalm chapter 2 thou shalt break them with a rod of iron thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel all right and um, let's see what do we got three mentions here in revelation in relation to the rod of iron and he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers even as i received of my father and she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with the rod of iron and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne and talking about Jesus and out of his mouth talking about Jesus goes a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron he treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God now the wrath of God happens when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven the judgment is are you saved or are you not saved all right and so uh, the out of his mouth goes a sharp sword now all we have to do is connect the dots and the Word of God is powerful sharper than two any two-edged sword so uh, right here it is. I don't want to butcher these verses here. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So when we read here in Revelation uh, 19 and out of his mouth goes a sharp sword this he's the Word of God and so he's going to know he's going to judge everyone who has ever lived every soul on whether they are saved or not saved all right that's it right in the wrathness or the I'm sorry the 
the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God is the destruction of the entire world including the unsaved people so he's gonna make everything new let's see if I can find a verse to support that oh I have to do this huh no I didn't have to but I'm doing it uh, Revelation 20 and he sat upon the throne and said behold I make all things new everything how many things all things all things are going to be new so this idea dear that unsaved people are going to get a second chance after Jesus comes in the clouds of, the, of heaven after the end of the world it's Looney Tunes man it's nuts but let's keep listening so the people who don't want him there there will okay. be believers that become believers there he won't have to rule them with a rod of iron but this is don't he won't have to rule unbelievers is that what she said Okay. Or no, she's talking about. I'm sorry, talking about believers. Let me just clarify. I want to make sure. The rod of iron, which is I've never. That's during the uh, millennial reign. With the rod that's of iron. Over, that's over the people who don't want him there. They're both okay. believers. That become believers there. He won't have to rule them with a rod. So if you're a believer. <laughs> But this is, there'll even be some wicked people in the earth while he's ruling. All right, so when Jesus comes, he's unsuccessful in his attempt to destroy all wickedness. So God lied here in Genesis 3, according to this woman, Kat Kerr. Oh there, there's going to be people That's who crazy, really. about it. It says they won't want to come ruling. There, there's going to be people That's who... That's crazy. That is crazy. I mean, real crazy. Really? Really? Because they won't want to come before his throne to show off what they have. You know what their land is giving them. And it says this in the Bible. That they'll, Christ will say, come and bring your goods before me so that I can bless him. And they won't want to come because they won't want him there. And he will say to those people, then you won't get rain on your land. These are... <laughs> She's talking about Old Testament prophecy that is not fully explained but better explained in the New Testament you're not gonna find that in the New Testament because the New Testament Jesus Christ specifically gives us a better explanation a more detailed explanation now she's talking about bringing offerings to God for their sins for the sins of the people Jesus offered his body as a one-time sacrifice for all sin forever and ever. So, essentially, those people that are saying that there's coming a time when people will have to go up to the holy mountain to offer uh, offerings and sacrifices and oblations, and the people that are saying that's going to happen in the future are disregarding the death of of Jesus Christ when he offered his body on the cross for us and not just for our sins only but for the sins of the whole world and this so this teaching can only come from Jews from the circumcised, from the concision. This doesn't come from the New Testament. This doesn't come from a true Christian. The idea that the offering that Jesus made of his body was not enough, or that it was only for a period of time. All right? And it, it's ridiculous. So essentially what she's saying is that the body and the death of Jesus covers us now but when he returns they'll have to go back to the Old Testament and make offerings to God and I mean it's just utter ridiculousness doesn't make any sense at all here I did this wrong but whatever 
Um, I think it's in. Uh, I apologize. It's in Revel or, uh, Hebrews ten. Oh, I think, or it might be Hebrews, right there. I apologize. Okay, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. But that's what she's saying, that after Jesus returns, there are going to be unsaved people who are going up to the holy mountain to make offerings of the blood of bulls and of goats to take away their sins. In other words, what Jesus did was no longer good enough to save them. All right, the whole idea is just lunacy, absolute lunacy. And again, I want to reiterate this. If you believe Jesus reigns a thousand years, explain to me what happens when Jesus is done reigning. These are wicked people, wicked leaders. They can't rule. They have no power to rule. There's no armies at that time on the earth. And then after a thousand years of Christ ruling, it says... Satan will be loose for a season to tempt those. Alright, so that's a great way to mix scripture. Now, so if we go to Revelation 20, we see that at the end of the thousand years, that Satan is loose for the purpose of gathering together the unsaved to be at our feet so that fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them all. That's a fulfillment of what we read in Genesis 3. Now, she's now, um, that is directly connected to the hour of temptation in Revelation 3. Because that has kept my word of patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. The judgment day. The judgment of are you saved or are you not saved? Born people will live to be eight, nine hundred years old during that thousand years. No. And whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, so now you're just going nuts. As Satan will be loose for a season to tempt those who are born people will live to be eight, nine hundred years old during that thousand years. No, nobody is living that long during this thousand years. So Immediately after the flood, how how old was Noah? Oh goodness sakes! Uh, I can't remember exactly. He was nine hundred and fifty years old. I wanted to say it, and I didn't. Okay, so he was nine hundred and fifty years old, and he lived what was it? Four hundred years, four hundred fifty years, whatever it was. I don't remember now, but it doesn't matter. After the flood, but after the flood. People lived much uh, shorter lives. I want to do this right here. And Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his natural force ab abated. No, okay, so... I, I could get into all that, but there, nobody is living. And this is well before baby Jesus was born. So what she's saying is that non-believers, apparently, I, I'm not real sure if she's clear about this. I'll have to rewind it just a tad. Non-believers will live after the return of Jesus Christ. The unsaved people will live eight to 900 years old. A lot longer than what they're living now. I mean, where are you getting this stuff, man? It's like you're taking the Bible and you're just mixing and squishing and screwing it all up and coming up with this doctrine. It's as if you have no understanding of the Bible whatsoever. So <laughs> you're all over the place here. And so in Revelation 20, and Jesus, and when Satan is loosed, is when Jesus comes. 
in the clouds of heaven. We are lifted up. Satan is loose to gather the unsaved at our feet. There's, I mean, to get technical here, there's, you're taking Revelation 20 and mixing it with Revelation 3. And there's no, really no reason for that. And then you throw in people will be living 900 years old, which goes back to the Old Testament. You're just all over the place. During that thousand years and won't die. So don't split them over Okay, time. so people are living 900 years old, 800, 900 years old during a thousand year period. That doesn't even begin to make any sense at all. No sense at all. Is this the same scriptures that talk about if you don't come up before to Jerusalem and celebrate tabernacles that, that, that it won't go well with you? Is, it, am I, is that the same area? It says it will not be. God said it won't, he will say to them, I will not send rain on your land if you don't come. Oh. Okay. All right. So, again, it's a reference to Old Testament. I don't think she knows what she's talking about at all. And I just wanted to show you how ridiculous this stuff is. They never once mentioned what happens when Jesus is done reigning. And, you know, I've heard somebody the other day make a remark that, um, that, Jesus hands over the reins to the Father. Well, Jesus is the Father. There are not two gods. There's one God. It's Jesus. Alright. So, rather than getting into that, let me just quickly share. Mario Murillo, or whoever this guy is, wrote a blog. And this guy is asking what Steve Schultz's opinion is. Is he staying neutral? And... So I was just curious about this blog, Mario Murillo, or whatever his name is. Uh, 20 million views. I mean, I, I didn't know people looked at blogs. But wow, that's a lot of people. Alright, so apparently this Mario was on certain television shows, and he was troubled. He says, I had to step away for two reasons. You will notice that both reasons have only to do with soul winning. The harvest is so great that it is consuming all of my time while the harvest hasn't come, Mario. All right, there is a definite concern of people committing suicide. And I think typically people commit suicide because they're feeling guilty because they've done something horrible and they've ruined their reputation. And... Um, they don't they don't realize that life is so full of change that your life can change your life one year from now can be completely different than what it is right now life is unpredictable but young people they're not taught the hope of the Lord Jesus Christ they're taught that they are animals that they evolved from a monkey and that they'll die just like a monkey all right and with no conscious of the Old Testament law of the law of Moses uh, and they are told that the Lord Jesus Christ is a fictional character and they believe it and then they real and then they sin they do something stupid and they feel so guilty because of what they've done. Not realizing that everybody is guilty of being stupid and doing stupid things. And they're consumed with their guilt. They're consumed with what it's going to do for the reputation that they view of themselves in their own mind. Because they have so much pride. And they're not taught to be humble. And they think that their life is destroyed, not realizing life will change. It changes for everybody dramatically all the time. And so they turn to thoughts of severe depression, believing that suicide is an escape, and not realizing that Jesus Christ is our scapegoat. 
he will lead us out of this wicked world because we are in a wicked world and we do need a scapegoat we do need a, somebody to deliver us from this wicked world and imagine if all the public schools taught the law of Moses what an effect the impact it would have on all these children's lives if they knew the law of Moses and of course the law of Moses is our schoolmaster to bring us to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ to realize that hey we need a Savior we have a Savior suicide is not the answer Jesus Christ is the answer and this life on earth is so short and there's just really no need to get hung up on one stupid thing or two stupid th I mean you want to count up the number of stupid things give me a couple of hours and I'll count them up and you'll blush because my stupidness completely outweighs your stupidness I guarantee it ain't nobody more stupid than I am I've done so many stupid things you wouldn't believe it yeah, okay so anyway and the second reason I stepped away is because I do not want to be on the same time as a other guest a certain other guest it has to do with association with two false preachers I went to him as Jesus taught privately I implored this person to deal with the counterfeit voices he did not agree with my counsel one of these false ministers is called a prophet and another is called a seer why am I so adamant about these false prophets once again you will see it has everything to do with preaching the gospel so so far I'm okay with this blog the problem is when you don't clearly simply and easily explain what the gospel is okay you're gonna say hey these guys aren't preaching the gospel well then tell us what the gospel is and of course the gospel is believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved that's the gospel it's very simple all right it's all about faith it's always been about faith and of course there's a whole lot of people out there that are teaching faith is not enough all right they're all liars and on the fast track to hell now this is interesting these false preachers say things that are absolutely insane and unscriptural examine one of them claims to see roller coasters mountains of jello pudding ponds cows on tractors and a fictional character of Santa Claus in heaven there is no way this is true because the Bible says that all the works of earth will be burned up that means they will not reappear in heaven second Peter 3 but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up so there is not gonna that's right there's not gonna be a, a Santa Claus and roller coasters and mountains of jello pudding ponds cows on tractors I mean that's all nonsense I in I don't know who's teaching that but how in the world somebody could get away with that um, is Looney Tunes Looney Tunes so that you know that the mountains of jello um is interesting because I talked about this a while back um where oh wait a second he says something here doesn't he about uh, right there the other false prophet is just as dangerous recently he stood in a pulpit in Nashville and told the people to shut up if they did not believe there were mountains of jello in heaven he claimed God turned the Red Sea into jello then he said there is a secret code that prophets know and we needed to trust the prophets who possess this code in order to understand a deeper level of the Bible this my friend is straight up new age and occult teaching not to mention medieval Catholicism 
All right, so he's right about this, except um, the Bible does talk about uh, uh, this might be the only mention in the Bible with that word. Okay, so with the blast of thy nostrils, the waters were gathered together, the flood stood upright as in heap, and the depths were congealed in the heart of the sea. So that word is similar to jello, having become semi-solid, especially on cooling. Okay, so it's like jello. I wouldn't call it jello, but that is a far cry from this idea that there are mountains of jello and puddings of ponds or whatever, and all this other non the cows on tractors. Uh, roller coaster. I mean, all that's nonsense, okay? And so shut up if you don't listen to this guy. Now the problem here, this is the attitude, this one down here, the secret code that prophets know. This attitude that, hey, I went to Bible college when I was a 19-year-old snot-nosed kid, and I know the Bible and you can't overrule me. That's the attitude of a lot of people. A lot of pastors, a lot of preachers, they go to seminary school when they still rubbing the snot off their nose. And they think because they were a young brat and that they learned from a teacher that they know more of the Bible than you who has spent the last 20 years as an old man or old woman reading and believing the Bible. That's... That's uh, crazy, like our friend said here. That, that stuff is crazy. Crazy, he said. You're crazy. So, the secret. Yeah, I mean, people really do want to possess a deeper level of the Bible. And it's very clear when you read the Bible to have a deeper understanding, a deeper level of understanding in the Bible is very simple. The secret. The key is to have faith. Believe that the Bible that you hold in your hands is from God. That's the key. That's the secret. It's not in these uh, phony baloney extra biblical books. It's not in these seminary school Bible colleges. You're not getting secret knowledge from those guys. It's not from gurus or any of these people that claim to have gone to heaven and come back. The secret is not outside, it's inside the Bible and having faith. And it's always been about faith. This, the whole secret, the whole key to everything has always been about faith. All the way from Noah to now and forever. Let's go to Hebrews here. Is it Galatians or Hebrews? I forget already. By faith, Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. So it's always been about faith, and that's the secret, that's the key, and even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil, the veil is upon their heart. Why is the veil upon the, their heart? Because they don't have faith. They're blinded. They can't see because they lack faith. But once faith has come, nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. How's the veil taken away? Because now you have faith. Now you have eyes to see. And now that you are born of God, the Spirit of Truth is in you. And your eyes are open. He dwells in you and he will show you 
all things which you desire to know and de desire to see. When the Spirit of Truth has come, that is when you are born of God, the Spirit of Truth comes and dwells in you and He will guide you into all truth. And it, I'm telling you, the Bible's very clear. It's about faith. It's always been about faith. Alright, so that's all I got. I just I hope I've shared the truth with you to told and told you what the truth is and showed you what these people are teaching falsely. I hope I've been fair about it. And if I've not been fair, let me know. Thank you.